The show begins as a little boy, Jibril, wakes up his mother after a nightmare. Jibril lost his father at a young age and asks his mother why this happened. In response, his mother tells him nothing happens without God's will, so it must be part of a plan. A quick fast forward in time, and we see a grown-up Jibril as he pulls his mother's corpse from the rubble of his home, which was recently bombed. Crying, he lays his mother to rest and heads to the street outside. Elsewhere, a news segment explains that the city of Damascus in Syria is on the brink of falling to the terrorist group ISIS. Meanwhile, Jibril encounters his friend Samir on the streets which are lined with civilians begging soldiers to let them pass through security barricades. As they wander aimlessly, they stumble upon a charismatic man named Al Masi, addressing a growing crowd of listeners. As ISIS forces ready themselves to invade Damascus, the preacher tells everyone that God will save them as they have suffered enough. Right on cue, a massive wall of sandstorm approaches the city and completely envelopes it. While everyone scatters to take cover, Al Masi continues to preach throughout the storm. A little over a month later, we learn that the sandstorm was of biblical proportions as it wrought calamitous damage, but also buried ISIS ground forces. Lasting 42 days in total, the storm cut off the terrorist organization's supply chain and forced them to withdraw. In the aftermath of this event, Al Masi takes credit for the storm and claims to be leading his 2,000 followers to their destiny. Next, we are introduced to CIA agent Eva Jeller who is at the hospital watching the events unfolding in Syria through the television. A nurse comes in and explains her the side effects of the medicine prescribed before discharging her. At this point, we do not know what health problems she has, but after being discharged from the hospital, Eva breaks down in her car before quickly composing herself. Later at work, she explains to an interviewee the ethos of working in the CIA. Truth isn't gray, only black and white. Simultaneously, she is also watching footage of this new messiah figure from the Middle East. That night, Eva ignores a call from her father to talk to her colleague Q, who shares some information on the messiah character. Over a secured line, Q tells her that Al Masi came originally from Egypt and discusses what his aims might be. After the call, Eva injects the prescribed medication into her stomach and notices a clump of her hair fall out. Unable to fall asleep, she then heads to an all-night diner and works until 3 a.m. here. She meets Kian, a waiter at the restaurant and also a political science student. During a brief conversation, Kian reveals that he had an uncle who worked for the CIA but sadly died in Turkey the previous year. Meanwhile, in the desert outside Damascus, Jibril sits down with Al Masi and a group of older men. One of those old men points out that Jibril is a shoemaker's son and hence it would be foolish to include him in any conversation regarding holy scriptures. However, Al Masi chastises him and says that God works through all believers. The preacher then asks why there are no women among his followers, and the same old man laughs at the question. As a result, Al Masi knocks him to the ground, telling him to find a woman and give her his seat. Later that night, Jibril watches Al Masi from afar as he appears to talk to the stars above. Suddenly, he calls Jibril and asks to sit beside him. They have a small conversation where the preacher says that God will ask the boy some difficult questions soon. On the other side of the world, Eva speaks with her boss, Catherine Bailey, about the mysterious preacher in Syria. She wants to keep an eye on him and is given minimal resources to do so. Using satellite imagery, she finds Al Masi and his followers in the desert near Damascus. To her surprise, they are moving away from the capital of Syria and heading towards the border with Israel. We then shift back to the desert, where Al Masi's followers begin to realize that he is leading them towards Israel. The opinions are split, as some believe that he has led them to their deaths, while others believe he is leading them to a battle. However, Al Masi tells his followers to bury their weapons deep into the ground, and they reluctantly agree. Completely defenseless, they approach the border where Israeli guards see them coming. As the guards call for backup and rush to the border with guns, Al Masi himself crosses the border quite nonchalantly. Tensions start to quickly rise as one of the guards fires a warning shot, but is stopped by a senior Israeli official who arrives just in time with the backup. Worried that the world's media will be quickly on the scene, the senior officer orders his men to arrest Al Masi. In the next scene, Shin Bet agent Avram grills Al Masi about his border crossing. With unnerving calm, the preacher claims his Jewish heritage and says he just wants to see the Holy Land. Undeterred, Avram warns him not to get too clever with his answers. But Al Masi drops a bombshell, calling the veteran agent by name and references a long ago incident with a boy in Megiddo. The mysterious preacher then questions if that was the day Avram lost his faith in God. Visibly panicked, Avram deletes the footage of the conversation and orders Al Masi to be put in solitary confinement. Later that night, Avram gets drinks with a colleague at a bar and asks if he ever told anyone about Megiddo. Baffled at the question, 
His colleague says he never mentioned anything about the incident to anyone. They quickly finish their drinks and head home when suddenly Avaram has a flashback. He is strangling someone in the back seat of his car. Quickly snapping back to alertness, Avaram returns to his station where he finds Almas's cell empty. We then shift to the small US town of Dili, where we are introduced to the Egero family. Felix Egero, a local preacher, runs a church whose traditional sources of income are quickly drying up. His wife, Anna Egero, has been secretly day drinking after worrying all day about the family's financial condition. On the other hand, their daughter, Rebecca Egero, is taking a stroll out in the Texan desert. As she gazes up at the afternoon sun, Rebecca suddenly collapses in what looks like a seizure. Later, when she wakes up by herself, she heads straight for home, where her parents are arguing. The Egero family is financially strapped due to Rebecca's medical bills. Later that evening, Rebecca tells her boyfriend about her last night's dream. In her dream, her hometown was destroyed killing everyone and raging everything to the ground. She then breaks up with her boyfriend and walks off, planning to leave the town forever. While this is happening, her father, who is out in the city, is staring at a sign telling us that gas is highly flammable. Coincidentally, Felix has an empty gas barrel in the trunk of his car. Meanwhile, CIA agent Eva Jeller arrives in Tel Aviv looking for more information about the Messiah figure. Her colleague, Q, drives her to the Israeli Information Headquarters in Jerusalem. At the center, Chief Officer Zev summons Avram, as he was the last person who saw El Masi before he escaped. During the meeting, Zev reveals that the CCTV cameras were turned off for 12 minutes while the detainee escaped. On top of that, Eva questions Avram's motives behind deleting the interrogation video with Al Masi. Angered by the accusations, Avram tells them he is only doing his job and storms out. The veteran agent then goes to his daughter's school and picks her up for a day out. However, on the way to the market, he sees a man who looks like Al Masi and runs after the stranger, leaving his daughter alone in the car. Unfortunately, he was chasing the wrong guy while the real Al Masi was in another part of town, at the steps of the Dome of the Rock. Slowly, the people around the mosque start to recognize the preacher, and a huge crowd gathers around him. Al Masi approaches the top of the steps and calls for an end to the violence that has stained those steps with blood for generations. This incident is being recorded by several security cameras and civilian phones. The mysterious preacher then calls for people to step forward to be judged for their sins, and a young boy comes ahead. Just then, the Israeli police show up, and a gunshot rings out, killing the boy on the spot. It is not clear who opened fire, but the Al Masi puts his hands on the boy and miraculously awakens him back to life. However, the angry crowd begins to descend on the police and in the ensuing chaos, Al Masi slips away. In the aftermath of the shooting, riots break out throughout the city and an intifada is called by the Palestinian leadership. In the meantime, we see Q who reveals himself to be a member of the Israeli secret service, Mossad. As Q and Eva review footage, they begin to think that the whole incident could be set up by the Messiah figure. Hence, Q and Eva attempt to find the boy from the footage, suspecting he is also in on the act. When they make their way to the boy's home later that night, they find out that the family has vanished. The next day at the refugee camp, relief workers arrive with food and water. In reality, these workers are Mossad agents in disguise who are looking for Al Masi. That night, the refugees discuss why their leader hasn't returned to help them. As Jibril looks into the night, he sees a light beeping in the distance. Soon afterwards, he approaches it and arrives at the fence line, where a woman offers him bread. Unbeknownst to Jibril, Avram is watching this from a distance, too. While Jibril returns to his camp from the fence, Avram knocks him unconscious and takes him hostage. Across the pond, in the small town of Dili, Rebecca packs her bags and hits the road in the dead of night. Unaware of this, her father, Felix, too, is up at night and sneaks out of the house. We see him climb a ladder and disable the fire alarm system in the church. He then goes to the gas station and brings a gallon of petrol to the church. Just as he is about to pour the gas all over the place, his wife, Anna, bursts in. After a brief moment of awkwardness, she yells that their daughter Rebecca is nowhere to be found, and the husband and wife rush back to their house. While her parents scream their way through the house trying to find her, Rebecca is on the outskirts of Dilly. Just a few miles away, a tornado is quickly approaching the town. With nowhere else to go, Rebecca smartly hides in a drainage ditch by the roadside. On the other hand, her parents reluctantly decide to rush into the tornado shelter along with other people in the neighborhood. 
Just as Felix is about to close the door of the shelter, he gets a glimpse of a person standing in the path of the approaching tornado. He thinks it is Rebecca, but when the person turns around, it turns out to be Al Masi. Back in Israel, Eva and her team are frantically searching for signs of the mysterious Messiah figure in the neighboring country of Jordan. Suddenly, one of the team members sees an Instagram video of Al Masi returning Rebecca to her parents in Texas. Immediately, Eva heads for the airport and catches a plane to the United States. In Texas, the tornado has completely obliterated the town of Dilly, except for the church, which is the only building left standing. Inside, Felix and Al Massey have a conversation about religion and faith. Felix was about to light his church on fire in order to claim insurance to save his family from financial ruin. But he was stopped by this mysterious figure from the Middle East whose videos he had seen all over the internet. The old church preacher starts to think that all this is a sign from God. Suddenly, their conversation is interrupted by an FBI agent who arrests Al Massey for illegally crossing the US border. Refusing to let this happen, Felix immediately arranges a lawyer for the mysterious messenger of God. The scene then shifts to Israel, where Avram is torturing Jibril for more information on Al Masi. When Jibril replies that God sent Al Masi, Avram vows to show him that God doesn't exist. The veteran, Shen Bet agent, then knocks out the poor boy and dumps his body on the side of the road in the middle of nowhere. A day later, Eva arrives in Texas intending to find Al Masi and question him. While on her way, Q tells her that a private plane from Amman in Jordan was forced to land in a border town in Mexico due to bad weather. The US border is only 5 miles from the town in Mexico, so they suspect that Al Masi must have boarded the plane. Soon afterwards, Eva appears to be distressed and has to force the taxi to pull over so that she can puke. When she reaches the site where Al Masi is being kept by the FBI, an agent tells her that she will only be allowed to see him the next day. That night, in her hotel room, Eva gets a call from her dad, and as usual, she tells him to give her some space. As the call comes to an end, Eva looks down at her blood-covered sheets and trousers. We do not know if it is the effect of her medicine, but she has a horrified look on her face. The show comes to an end as Eva takes her hotel sheets to a laundromat to clean them of the blood stains. Here, she sees a bird trapped in the room, desperately trying to escape the window. Perhaps as a symbol of her mental state, she remarks that the bird is not where it is supposed to be. Subscribe for more videos like this, turn on the notification, and leave 1000 likes or 100 comments if you'd like us to continue part 2. Thank you.